So sports is dangerous. But people are not going to stop playing them. This Lenore with an unbelievable hit and swift. So the NFL has paid $1 million to make this FDM 3D printed helmet that is made with basically the same machine that you have on your desk. But why did they do that and what makes this helmet so special? Okay, so let's roll it back a little bit. This is Gabriel Boutin. He is an industrial designer based in Canada that has been working on helmets since 2009. But in 2016, he became interested in how 3D printing could be applied to his craft to make helmets better than they were before. And this kind of makes sense if you think about it. 3D printing, many people don't realize, is actually very good good at making foams, at making soft parts, at making controllable parts. It is often better than most traditional foams and padding that's out there, so it has been used in these types of applications before. It breathes better, you can make a helmet or a set of pads that are bespoke so they fit the person better, and when that fits better they become a lot more safe. You can design in special structures to it so that some places are hard and some places are soft. And actually, dirty little secret, printed parts can actually be easier to wash because traditional like rubber foam soaks up so much sweat and grime and grease to where even if you spray it with a hose, you can't clear it out. But 3D printed structures can actually be rinsed off because they're just a rubber part. So they can actually just be more sanitary than a lot of the traditional forms of padding. So with that in mind, Boutin decided to chase down helmets. And he started off with, obviously, a bike helmet. He ended up using HP Multi-Jet Fusion, which allowed him to try a lot of the things that were available with 3D printing at the time. The custom structures, the washability, the customizability. And he was able to launch a Kickstarter for it. The Cupola helmet was originally going to sell for $300 and would be custom sized to the wearer's head. Now, I will admit we were not able to find the Kickstarter again in order to verify how the funding had gone, but the Kickstarter is no longer there. It is a ghost, lost to the history of the internet. But if memory serves, funding went through okay. But who cares? That's all backstory stuff anyway. In 2019, the NFL launched a $1 million helmet challenge. Now seeing this opportunity, Boutin said, of course, I have this MGF 3D printed bike helmet. I will, of course, course, pursue this helmet challenge with FDM. This is kind of an interesting little flip. If you're familiar with multi-jet fusion, it is a powder-based process. You have a layer of powder shot down, and then there's a layer of ink put along it that binds the powder together, and then that ink is cured, and then you do that over and over again, as compared to FDM, which is like a really high-resolution hot glue gun. Multi-jet fusion is a $150,000 machine, but FDM is a $150 machine. So why, as a designer, would you make such a giant switch to a completely different process with no synergies at all. Well, let's talk about economics for just a little bit. For a 3D printed helmet, MGF actually probably wasn't the best. I had mentioned before that the bike helmet was $300. That has to do with proprietary materials and a lot of post-processing that has to be done with traditional powder parts. Regardless of how the part is designed or how it's made, it always has to be pulled out of a caked square in order to distribute the parts. And you have a lot of tracking problems and all kinds of other things. It's kind of a convoluted process to work with in a production environment if you're making customized items. And this can cause all kinds of problems when you're trying to scale. It's really not a very good process if you want to make 10,000 helmets. Though admittedly, there are only 1,700 NFL players in the league at any given time, and they most certainly have the budget to pay for whatever type of gear they want. But even so, in order to create a product that's for real, you need to make sure that you can actually kind of mass produce it. And MGF just wasn't right for that. So that probably factored into Boutin's decisions about how to make his helmet and how to pursue this new challenge. Not to mention the fact that prototyping is just cheaper with an FDM machine. But even more than that, Boutin was actually experimenting with FDM even before the NFL Grand Challenge. It wasn't sudden, some sudden switch. Before this prize, he had actually been working with a website called Nonplanar XYZ, and he was playing around with Nonplanar 3D printing before it was cool. Literally, if you're not familiar, Nonplanar 3D printing is when a 3D printer doesn't just print a single layer and then move up, but it actually will follow a three-dimensional curve growing the part around and in different directions. This can be really useful because you get to create really complex shapes that have a different sort of geometry and uniformity to them that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get with traditional FDM with just the layers. A really good example of where this is useful is literally just a simple dome. A simple dome can be printed layer by layer, but then as you get towards the top where the layers are more pronounced, it would be really great if you could just print that curve. And nonlinear and nonlinear 3D printing lets you do that. Rather than moving from the layer and just growing the top up like it's a pixelated circle, what it does is it smooths out the top and just follows the curvature of the part itself, which can create pretty good surface quality. But there are other problems with it. Anyway, Boutin was designing hardware and software in order to enable nonplanar 3D printing. 
turns out you actually kind of need a really custom nozzle to get it done and a whole bunch of other tricks, but that's a different video. But since it's so good for creating curved parts, maybe it would be good for creating the curved inner pad for a helmet. Needless to say, this was the right thing at the right time. And right off the bat, Collide Helmets was able to raise a quarter of a million dollars from the NFL Challenge in order to pursue the concept further of these FDM 3D printed pads. But this wasn't the initial prize. This was a separate grant from the Head Health Tech Helmet Challenge. They had not gotten to the NFL $1 million challenge yet. And while it seems like everything is all teed up to do pretty well here, things were about to get a little bit harder. All right, I want to stop right here because the NFL is not the only one that runs prizes in order to get people to create awesome new products. Right now, Slant 3D is running a prize too, and it's through our Portals Marketplace. We created Portals to be a fast and easy way for 3D model designers to get their products out into the world. They can literally upload a design and about 30 seconds later, they will have a link to a product listing where anybody can purchase their product. We are so proud to have this finally available because designers no longer have to have print farms to produce their products the way they had just a year ago, but now they can actually focus on design. But in order to encourage this even more and bring more people into this, and especially help students to get involved with creating these types of products, we've introduced the Slant 3D Portals Prize. The Portals Prize is a thousand dollar prize if you can sell a thousand dollars worth of stuff through your Portals website. If you want to learn how to sell, we have videos talking about how to do this, and there are many awesome products out there that many people have a lot of demand for. Not to mention the fact that we're moving right into the Christmas season right now, so this is the easiest time to do it. The prize is very simple. All you have to do is sign up for Portals and start listing products and sell until you hit $1,000. When you hit $1,000 in revenue, we will pay you straight up $1,000. The one catch to this is that it is only open to students. You will have to sign up for Portals with a .edu account in order to prove that you are actually a student and not just some Johnny come lately, but that is a super easy process and you can have your portal store set up in a couple of minutes. This prize will be live for the next two months and we cannot wait to see what so many awesome creators from around the world will make from it. So if you want to check it out, go over to slantpod.com, that's slantpod.com, or check out the link down below. All right, let's get back to Collide. That quarter of a million dollars they initially raised allowed them to continue to develop the helmet concept and officially enter, enter the prize in 2020. And in 2021, Collide was named one of three winners of that prize. A prize they shared with Impressio and Zenith. Not to be a little bit foreboding here, but Zenith paused operations in January of 2025, and Impressio was just a demonstration project from EOS. So of the three winners of the Helmet Grand Challenge, there is only one that still exists. And we will get to how well they're existing here after a couple more things. From winning the prize, Collide pulled down $550,000. And together with other research partners inside of Canada, they have continued to develop the helmet concept forward since winning the prize in 2020. And the helmet today is a lot different from the helmet initially than in the prize. If you look at the helmet that was submitted inside the prize, it was kind of traditional. You would look at it and say, oh yeah, that's a bunch of FDM printed parts with the infill showing. That's an understatement of what it was because they did a lot of topology optimization and that kind of stuff in order to create the cushioning for those initial helmets. And of course the non-planar 3D printing in order to get them produced. But there are some new helmets today that look a lot different. The newest helmets that they've released effectively have a series of shock absorbers around the head. And now you would say, yeah, Gabe, of course, pads are always shock absorbers. I mean, like, no, I mean, real shock absorbers. Basically, instead of having a piece of cushioning in each place that happens to be 3D printed, what they have done is they've used the ability of 3D printing to create mechanisms and geometry and complex structures in order to create a literal shock absorber at strategic places around the head in about three different styles that allow them to really tune how the helmet performs in different areas. This is a completely different design from what anybody else has ever done. Even Carbon 3D has made 3D printed helmets before, but again, they look like just a 3D printed pad. Collide has actually created 3D printed mechanism. They're made of TPU and they look amazing. They look like the shock absorber on the bottom of your car. And I want to emphasize that this type of thing could never have been manufactured before. The reason padding is used so universally is because it's affordable and it's also reliable, but you couldn't create mechanisms that are shot in a single machine ever before. Now with 3D printing, they're able to create these types of mechanisms to where you can have a shock absorber 
absorbing plunger designed in a space like this and have it actually functional and fully assembled as soon as it comes off the machine. This isn't actually a true innovation that is non-linear from what everybody thinks about with 3D printed stuff. It is really a deep understanding of the process. And it's really cool to see Collide knows their stuff well enough to design something this intentionally. And it must be working. Collide has since partnered with Light Helmets, who are a manufacturer and distributor of helmets for high school football which means that they now have to produce these at scale. The helmet that they are making is called the Light Apache, and you can look at it on their website and see the shock absorbers on it. It is, again, a really awesome piece of engineering, and it shows in the performance of it. It is both a very lightweight helmet, but also a very performant helmet. In fact, the lightest and the most performant of most of the light helmet lineup. And this is being an alternative to foam. While it is using a denser material in the form of TPU, the fact that they're able to so efficiently create the shock absorption inside the helmet, they're not having to waste material and waste space. So they still get all the advantages of really good protection, really lightweight feel, and something that can actually be washed, because again, rubber plungers that can just be sprayed off with a hose. Collide is currently scaling up operations in order to continue producing helmets for light at the high school level. There are a lot more high school kids playing football than there are NFL players, but they are in 28 out of the 32 NFL locker rooms. Admittedly, that's not every football player in the NFL, but being on most of the teams is a really big deal. And this is with the Light Gladiator Thunder Helmet. And that first NFL run was probably the proof of concept for Light to, in order to realize that the 3D printed helmets were actually able to be produced. So yeah, Collide seems to be doing okay. Sometimes there is this question, where is 3D printing actually useful? It's just for making tchotchke stuff at home. But that's the biggest misunderstanding of the technology out there. It is a deeply useful technology for people who understand how to use it and understand how to create create original and unique products from it. The Collide helmets are a wonderful example of using 3D printing. They are creating an object that could not exist without the technology, and they leverage the technology to create advantages that never existed before. They're not just 3D printing a standard foam pad. No, they have invented a shock absorber for your head that is able to perform at a level that was never possible with foams before, but was also never manufacturable before. 3D printing has enabled this. It is a technology that gives people new tools. And it brings me back to a really old example of just the electric motor. When the electric motor first came out, you know how it was used? They would build a giant one and replace the steam boiler in the center of the factory. But then that giant electric motor would spin a big old spindle and a ton of belts would go to all the machines inside of the factory. But then it took another 20 years for people to realize, oh, we don't need to build a giant motor for the whole factory. We can build little motors for all the individual machines, which means that now the factory is no longer designed around that giant motor. People's thought processes and how to use the technology had to shift because of what the technology enabled. People will always try to sub a new technology directly in for an old one, but then they will learn that the new technology has all kinds of new advantages. And this is what we're seeing with printing. Entirely new advantages being presented by people who deeply understand it and design around it. So if you want to see more awesome stories like this, I recommend subscribing to this channel where we talk about these types of real products that have produced thousands or more of the product itself in very professional environments. It is difficult to sell something to the NFL. And to have it so clearly successfully being used at that level of performance means that it's not just for making fidget dragons. It is a process for making real final finished products that are unlike anything you've ever seen before. And Collide is just getting started. They have started with football helmets, but they're a Canadian company. They probably wanna make some hockey helmets or some rugby helmets or basically any other type of helmet that exists. And of course, I don't imagine that someday they'll probably get back around to making some bike helmets. Have a great day, everybody.